Well, hello, everybody. This is Ralph Fletcher, and this is Writing with Ralph. Um, I'm glad to have you with me today for about 20 minutes to talk about writing and actually do a little bit of writing ourselves. So you'll need some paper or something to write on, uh, iPad, whatever, whatever you're comfortable with. Um, I've got this pretty cool shirt. Um, sometimes I do author visits to school, and occasionally the school will give me a a little gift um, and this shirt was a gift from a school that I visited and the teacher's name was Mike Reynolds um, a wonderful writing teacher wonderful teacher and um, it's become one of my favorite shirts so uh, <clears throat> seems appropriate for what we're talking about today um, so I'm going to uh, start off by by reading guys a couple poems um, of mine um, and one of them is a book, it's a poem from my book, um, Have You Been to the Beach Lately? This book is out of print, but um, one of the things I like to write about is um, babies. Um, and you might say that's an odd thing to write about, and maybe it is, but I think babies are really interesting. They're uh, strange, they're weird, they do all kinds of funny things. And if you think about it, a baby is usually the most interesting thing in a room. Um, so. Um, if you ever um, are on a bus um, or a plane or a church and there's a baby in front of you and that baby's bored and they want to play peekaboo and they want to have eye contact with you, the baby can play peekaboo for a long time. Anyway, this is something that happened um, at the beach one time um, and I wrote a poem called Beach Baby. Beach Baby. She's one year old, one tooth, a total pudge. She tries to get out of the water, but her soaked diaper must weigh 10,000 pounds, so all she can do is sit. Later, she sees me eating cheese puffs and toddles over, towering above me. A baby so giant, she blocks out the sun, sticks out her hand and yells, Mines! Her mother hustles over, apologizes, and hauls her back to their blanket. Then the baby starts eating sand, grinning, grinding the grains with that one tooth. And that's a poem called Beach Baby. And then I have another poem that I'd like to read to you. Um, and it is called, um, it is called New Baby. Um, and it's from my book over here. Sorry, I should have all this stuff ready. I'm a little bit discombobulated today. Um, it's a poem uh, from this book, Beach Baby, uh, from a, a book called uh, Relatively Speaking. And it's, it's a poem about, you know, when a baby is born, it seems like everybody starts talking about what different aspects of the baby's face looks like and how it compares to the relatives that are already alive. So um, it's a poem about that. New baby. <clears throat> Soon as the baby gets born, before she's two hours old, people start dividing her up. She's got daddy's big ears. She's got grandma's double chin. She has my olive eyes. Like she's just a bunch of barred parts stitched together. Well, I just got to hold her. I touched her perfect head, and I'll tell you this, my sister is whole. All right, so there's a couple of poems for you. Um, and you know, um, last time we got together, um, we read at the end of the session, I read that poem. Um, um, sometimes I remember the good old days, the good old days, and I invited you guys to borrow the first two lines and then the end, last two lines, and kind of ride the wave of that that poem. And um, some of you guys did. I got a bunch of really nice poems that were sent to me, uh, which I really appreciate. And this one is um, from a girl named Madeline, only a second grader, um, which is interesting because this is these sessions are sort of geared mostly for third to eighth grade. So, it's, but it's cool to have kids on both end of it um, that are there, that are participating with us. Sometimes I remember the good old days, petting Frank the dog with my cousins, baking brownie cookies with my mom, playing pool and air hockey with my brother, even though he always wins, going in the monkey bars and doing tricks for hours. My backyard becomes my habitat. It makes me feel active and free. I still can't imagine anything better than that. My backyard becomes my habitat. That's nice. It's a nice line. Good job, Madeline. And good job to all the people who sent me um, poems. I think you guys all did a really nice job. So, um, you know, I, 
I think we should just do a little bit of writing sometimes. Sometimes like we just kind of talk about it and the way you learn how to write isn't so much by talking about it, it's by doing it. So I'd like you to right now take a marker or a pen or pencil or a keyboard or whatever and I'm going to give you like just a minute and a half-ish and I'm going to ask you to write about how you're feeling right now. Are you feeling excited to be talking about writing? Are you feeling bored? Are you anxious about some things that are happening in the world? Um, have you seen too many video chats like this and you're just kind of getting burned out on them? Um, is somebody in your family annoying you? <laughs> whatever it is, whatever you're feeling. So I'll give you guys, um, I'll give you guys like a minute and a half and just let's have some quiet writing time and I'll actually do that also too. All right, so um, thanks for doing that, and um, you can share that with someone in your family if you want when we're finished. Sometimes you write things that you want to share, some things you really rather not share, but I'd invite you to share them if you'd like to. And maybe what you wrote today will give you a seed idea for something longer to write about. Um, and speaking of incubating a seed idea, which we talked, we talked about how um, I did that with my book, Twilight Comes Twice. Um, I just want to tell you about a book that I was working on, um, or an idea I was working on. Um, I was thinking about, you know, one thing kids love to do is play school. And so, um, I don't know what it is about that, but playing school is a real fun activity and everybody wants to be the teacher or have a turn playing the teacher. Um, so I started thinking about playing school, but from a different point of view. And I wondered about maybe, these. I could imagine these kids who go to the beach which is what's something that I did growing up many, many, many times um, and wanted to play school at the beach. And so I had an idea to write a book called Beach School. And I started in my notebook, you know, I started like writing ideas about beach school. What would the kids do? You know, I started thinking about maybe you could be playful about the kind of snacks they had, you know, because there's a lot of water around at the beach, obviously. So you could, the kids could eat watermelon or they could eat saltwater taffy, you know, things like that. Um, submarine sandwiches. And um, I just started, said to myself, would there be any homework at beach school? And I played around with that idea. And I wrote a, a manuscript up. And, um, you know, it's funny. It never actually got published. But I've got a good friend named David McPhail, the author and illustrator, who's probably created at least 150 books. I don't know how many books he's got. But um, he, he liked it a lot. You know, he doesn't love everything that I send him, but he really liked his ideas. He said it kind of gives you an idea of what school should really be like. So he decided to do his own illustrations, and he basically um, illustrated it. Now, this is, these are just sketches. If the book ever did get published, or if it does get published, the illustrations might be a little bit different than this. But it's, it, this will give you an idea. And I feel like the fact that he, that he did this, it, the book has already got its own life. So I'll just, I thought it would be just fun for me to read it to you. Beach School. And there's a, you'll see there's two sisters and a little brother. It's time for beach school. I'll be the teacher. My sister Emily will be the student. My brother Ray Ray wants to play too. He's almost four and a half, plenty old enough for this school. Emily takes a stick and draws a classroom in the sand. This school has four wide open walls to let in lots of sun and breeze. You can see since this is a rough copy, there are a few mistakes in the book. I draw the blackboard, we actually call it a sandboard, and write the date and teacher's name, Miss Periwinkle, that's me. Instead of morning, instead of the morning school bell, we've got zany seagulls crying, caw, caw, that tells us beach school is in session. <clears throat> it's my job to take attendance. Emily, here she says, Ray Ray, 
I'm hungry, he yells. He's always hungry. Ray Ray digs a hole in the sand. It fills with water as if by magic, and we study tiny creatures darting this way and that. <clears throat> I tell the class that baleen whales eat those these tiny shrimp, which are actually called krill. I'm hungry like a whale, Ray Ray complains, so I give him some crackers with peanut butter. Next, we go on a field trip to a tide pool. At beach school, you can't earn a gold star, but... Emily does find a starfish, a real one. Ray Ray likes it so much, he invents a, so, a new song right on the spot. Twinkle, twinkle, little starfish. Later, we lie on our backs and study the sky, and I ask what kind of clouds are floating overhead. Emily knows the right answer. Cirrus, is it going to rain, asks Ray Ray. He sounds worried. Nope, I tell him. Cirrus clouds mean nice weather. After a while, a golden retriever appears, running through one school wall and out the other. That's one of my favorite pages, by the way. I just love the way he illustrated that. So it's great when you write something and, and the illustrator just writes it exactly the way you'd, you'd hope that it would be illustrated. Okay, back to the story. Hey, I almost forgot, I yell. Recess, we run off to ride the waves with boogie boards. After that, we do a science experiment to see exactly how long it takes to bury Ray Ray in the sand. Five minutes and 51 seconds. Lunchtime, we eat submarine sandwiches, watermelon with saltwater taffy for dessert. Emily leads us on a scavenger hunt and we find a long, narrow shell. I'm pretty sure it's a razor clam, though Ray Ray calls it a laser clam. It shoots lasers at the bad guys. Oh, brother. In the afternoon, we have silly poem writing time. Waves on the ocean, waves on the sand. There's a wumpy monster waving with a seaweed covered hand. But then, oh no, disaster! The entire sandboard gets erased by a sneaky wave. The tide's coming in. It's time to go home. Is there any homework, Emily asks, which makes us burst out laughing. There's never any homework at beach school. It's always a little sad to pack up and leave, but I know we'll be back soon. And beach school will be waiting. The end. Okay. Well, great. Um, <clears throat> thank you for letting me share that with you. That was uh, really fun. and. Um, so I am going to now switch gears and we're going to talk about um, something that I do when I write. Um, you know, when I'm writing, I'm really trying to pay attention and sometimes like look closely at, at something. You know, I th that's what writers do. Writers really lean in and observe the world. That's one of the things that you use when you write. And um, I've been doing a lot of wood cutting. I, we had these trees that had to come down, so my brother-in-law and I spent a couple days um, cutting up the wood, which we're going to end up splitting. But I want to show you guys something. I brought I brought this piece of wood up from my uh, wood pile, and you know, um, wood, as you know, has little rings in it, and each ring is supposed to represent one of the years of the tree's life. So if you look closely, you can see those rings in there. But also, if you look really closely, there's those, those wonderful cracks that are radiating from the center. And think about how you as a writer would describe that. How would you describe that? Um, and if you'd like to try that, you can. Um, but really what I'm thinking about is, as a writer, think about ways that you can um, make your idea come alive by really describing what it looks like. I have this little, I collect rocks and have this little um, stone that, I didn't find this, I bought this, but if you look closely at it, you can see that in the middle, there's this wonderful little thing right there. So that rock, when you cut it in half, when you open it up, that's what you see in there. 
And how would you describe that in your writing? Be interesting. Um, in my notebook, I was I was writing about something that happened to me, and I wrote um, my cat. By, by the way, my cat's name is Snarf. This morning, Snarf licked me awake rousing my fingertips with a little swatch of sandpaper. I'll read that again. This morning, Snarf licked me awake, rousing my fingertips with a little swatch of sandpaper. So, um, I wanted to do that myself in a piece of writing. Um, and I'll just show you guys a picture, which I, you may have seen this before because it's in one of my books, uh, Marshfield Dreams, but I'm the oldest of nine children. And, um, so you can see there that that's me over here, and Jimmy, Elaine, Tom, Bob, and what's amazing that's only like that's only like half the family. There's also four other kids that hadn't even been born yet. So I'm the oldest of nine kids. Um, but my brother Jimmy was somebody that I you know wrote about um, a lot, and I have written about a lot. And um, we always had different pockets. You know, my mother had to clean. Um, the pants, and she knew which kid had which pair of, of of jeans or whatever because she knew what they'd find in the pocket. So I just want to read you the story from my book, uh, Marshfield Memories, and it's called Pocket Full of Trouble. I won't read the whole thing, but I'm just going to read you the beginning of it. Pocket Full of Trouble. Mom always emptied our pockets before she threw them in the washing machine. She could tell which pants belonged to which kids according to what she found tucked in the pockets. My pockets usually contained a small notebook and my big pen. In Jimmy's pockets, mom might, find ro mom might find rocks, fossils, scraps of wood, carved scraps of rope, carved wood, metal ball bearings, stuff like that. In Tommy's pockets, she might find marbles, money, plastic army guys, laneys, shells, beach glass, colorful leaves, Bobby, acorns, bottle caps, dandelion heads, Johnny, action figures, and matchbox cars. Emptying our pockets before washing those pants seemed like a sensible idea, but it could be hairy for Mom because she'd never know what she might discover. Once, when she reached into the pockets of a pair of jeans, she felt something warm and smooth. It was milkweed silk. Another time, she reached in and was shocked to feel something wriggling, a tiny toad, alive. Jimmy had found it by the small, by a, a small creek that ran behind our house and tucked it in his pocket. With toad in hand, Mom marched downstairs and gave Jimmy a stern lecture about the mistreatment of animals. She and Dad often preached that every life is sacred in God's eyes and shouldn't be harmed. They were strict about that. Jimmy felt bad. Nobody loved nature any more than he did. He carefully he carefully touched the poet. He had carefully tucked the toad into his front pocket and then set it free later, but he'd forgotten to take it out. Luckily, the toad wasn't harmed. Mom directed Jimmy to release the creature in the woods, which is what he did. Given all that commotion, nobody should have been surprised by what happened a few days later. Tommy found a piece of, of a wasp nest lying on the ground, brownish gray, about the size of a tennis ball. He showed it to me. We could see rows and rows of wasp larvae lined inside the, the comb. They seemed to be dormant. And, and what happens in the story is that Tommy forgets that it's in his pocket, leaves his dirty pants next to his bed we go away for the weekend and while we're gone those larvae get warmed up and they wake up they're in the nice warm house and when we came back the house was infested with wasps and that's from pocket full of trouble in marshfield dreams i think you guys would like that book so um that's kind of like near the end of our time together um and i guess you know, most of you talked about the importance of writing small. And by the way, obviously, when I say writing small, I don't mean making the words or the letters small, right? It means not writing in, in a general way about something, but really peering in closely and using those five senses. You know, when I wrote about, like, Snarf's tongue, like a swatch of sandpaper, you know, what did it feel like? It felt like sandpaper. What did it look like? Uh, what did it sound like? And so... Um, when I wrote about those pants pockets, I wanted to really tell what was in those pockets, really writing small. And like, how did it feel when my mother reached in the pockets and found that piece of that sort of silky milkweed uh, in there? So I would invite you guys to take something, anything, and really use your five senses and describe it and really try to get particular 
and granular and really pay attention to the particular and use all those five senses. And I would love um, to see that if you mail it to me. Remember, my email address is figpudding at gmail.com. No space and no caps. Fig pudding, which is the name of my book, Fig Pudding. Fig pudding at gmail.com. And if you send me any writing, um, I will try to respond to it. And maybe I'll even read it in one of these sessions here. So. Um, Thanks very much. It was great to spend some time with you guys. Um, happy writing. Bye.